master's degree. And I am a huge, huge literature buff. Um, so I have here from my university days, <laughs> my English literature book. It is thick as fuck. Holy moly. Like, what the fuck? And the pages are extremely, extremely thin. Like, I wish I can show you guys how thin these pages are, but they're thin enough that you could see, like, right through it, if that makes sense. Like, they are pa literally paper thin. <laughs> Like, you can hear how thin they are. <laughs> Anyways. So yeah, so I wanted to, um, one of the stories that we read in this book, um, one of the many stories that we read, they, they have, like, a, a lot of really cool books in here, um, or, like, stories within this book, is one by, um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And he wrote The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And it is actually a really cool rhyme. Like, it feels really cool. Let me just move this. There we go. It feels really cool. It sounds really cool. It's just a really, really cool, um, really, really cool rhyme. Or a really cool, uh, story. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I'll be doing that today. Um... Let me just adjust, hold on, a few things here. A little bit more warm, I think. Alright. Got my fire in the background. Got my book in front of me. I got my tea. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So... To start off, let me give you a little background <laughs> on Samuel Taylor. Oh, let me find him now. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. So, he used to be a university student in London, and it says here in the book, uh, he was a dreamy, enthusiastic, and extraordinarily precocious schoolboy. So that kind of tells you right off the bat what kind of person a poet is. <laughs> Why are poets always extraordinarily precocious? Who the hell knows? Uh, in 19... Oh, this is, how, this is how old it is. 1791. In 1791, Coleridge entered Jesus College, Cambridge. He was an accomplished scholar, but he found little intellectual stimulation at the university, fell into idleness, dissoluteness, and debt, and then despair fled to London and enlisted in the Light Dragoons under the alias of Celius Tomkin Comberbach. Imagine not being fulfilled by school. I found school hard. He's like one of the 1% that didn't find school hard at all. The fuck? In June of 19, or 1790, why do I keep saying 19? 1794, Coleridge met Robert Southley, a student at Oxford who, like himself, had poet poetic aspirations, was a radical in relig religion and politics, and sympathized with the Republican experiment in France. Together, the two young men planned to establish an ideal democratic community in America for which Coleridge coined the name Pantasque. They wanted to make their own little community, which is kind of funny because now people are doing that themselves. Twitch streamers are doing that themselves with social media and everyone coming together. There is like communities everywhere, which is kind of cool. They were essentially starting a book club, book community, <laughs> to put it in really lamest terms. So anyways, there's like this whole thing, this whole background on uh, Samuel Taylor. I won't go through all of it. Just because it is very, very uh, detailed in his life previously. Um, it just kind of goes on. I guess the more important parts of uh, after joint, after their joint publication of where Coleridge attended the University of Gottenton and began the lifelong study of German philosophers and critics Kant, Schiller, Schelling, and Fichte, that he helped profoundly his thinking about philosophy, religion, and aesthetics. So it kind of ties back now more to the philosophy side of things, which is fun. 
because that's where the ancient mariner is going to come from and that's what i studied i i i studied philosophy all through university so we'll be touching on that okay anyways um while continuing to lecture and write for newspapers on a variety of subjects he published biographia literatia zapoloia it's a drama apparently <laughs> In a book of consisting of the essays of the friend revised and greatly enlarged two collections of treat uh, treaties to those that followed over the next 15 years and he emerged as the heir to the conservation of edmund burke an opponent to secularism a defender of the england anglican church oh my god i can't say half of these things in here <laughs> anyways so this guy Steelheart, yeah, she says that ten times fast. I can't say half of these things ten times fast. There are huge words in here where my mouth just can't pronounce them for whatever reason. <laughs> so anyways, uh, it goes on a lot more about him. So I'm going to get into the actual poem that he did. He did a really, he, do, he does really cool poems. Um, so the other one he did was the Elonian Harp. And he also did the lime tree bower my prison. This lime tree bower my prison. I don't know what that is. But anyways, you can tell this is a study book. <laughs> words big, me small brain. <laughs> words big brain. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I can't even read that. Words big, me small brain. I got that part. That's, that's as far as I go. <laughs> yeah. Me small brain too. Anyway, it's fun. Why am I, why am I holding this up? Is because there's like little notes on the side here when I was actually studying this book. So it's fun. Fun to see that from like six years ago when I went through this book. My brain has gotten a lot smaller since then, that's for sure. <laughs> I watched too much Cap Caveman when I was younger. <laughs> What's Captain Caveman? I never had that here in, in Canada. We didn't have that. We had Captain Underpants. So I guess that's kind of equivalent. <laughs> it's a cartoon. <laughs> it must be a cartoon only to your specific area. Canada didn't get it. Unless, are you in Canada? Maybe Western, maybe the Western area's got it. Spin off of the Flintstones. Oh, there you go. That makes sense. <laughs> it's because you're old as dirt. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. A, wait, no. If it's a spinoff of the Flintstones, Flintstones itself, like, I know the Flintstones. It's not that old. It, if anything, it would technically be newer than the Flintstones. If it's a spinoff. <laughs> yeah, the cartoons, yeah, same. The cartoons I've watched no longer air as well. There are a lot of cartoons that no longer air. Yeah, the Flintstones was a big cartoon, that's true. It was big all over the place. I'm, I'm curious about this though. Captain Caveman. How old are we talking here? Let's see. I'm gonna search it up real quick here. Oh, it's not that old at all. I've seen this. I don't think it was big in Canada. That's the only thing. Yeah, original release was 1977. That's not that old. Uh, at least to me anyways. It would have been something that I've seen. Hmm. Cool. Wow, thanks. <laughs> I mean, like, it, it's one of those things where, like, how do I put this? Back in the 1980s, 1990s, it released two years after I was born. Oh, okay, there you go. That's not bad. But like, 
back in those days, the 1980s, the 1990s, it's not like today where you can get a plethora of cartoons available. So they had to do reruns for years and years, right? So, you know, it, it might have released originally in 1977, but the cartoon itself might have aired over and over again over the next, you know, 10, 15 years because there was nothing else to watch on TV. <laughs> content, content took a lot longer to create than it does now. Yeah, only cartoons on Saturday mornings. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, 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 cartoons, it, it took a lot more time to create content than it does now, so. Captain Caveman, now that I'm looking at the pictures, it does look a little bit familiar, that's for sure. <laughs> it does look very similar to the Flintstones, very similar. Yeah, it's true, yeah, if you didn't get up before 10, you missed all the cartoons, yep. <laughs> Yeah, the rest of the day would just be like midday TV show dramas, which were absolutely boring and that had like the weirdest music in it. And like when it didn't have music, it would just be absolute silence and like people just talking. <laughs> there was never any background noise. It was just literally people talking. East Coast USA. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm more Eastern Canada. So it's true. <laughs> <sighs> okay, anyways, so I think I'll get on with this. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I'm getting emails in. Oh, I do apologize. If you hear a phone go off in the middle of this, <laughs> I am technically working. So you might hear, uh, you might hear my, my cell phone ding every once in a while if I'm getting an email or something. I don't think I'll have to answer anything. Usually the morning time we'd never do anything. For work, which is nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can still answer emails on the side here. All right, so rhyme of the ancient mariner. Let me get my knee up. Ooh. Okay. So this is an epic, meaning that it consists of several parts that all flow together. So there are, uh, yeah, so there's seven parts exactly in this one, and each part has its own, like, its own little thing, and then it all ties together. So, like, the first part will be in a wedding, the second part will be the mariner starting to tell his tale, the third part will get more into the tale, and, uh, yeah, that's how, essentially, this, this epic will work, this epic poem, which is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, we'll start. And it's it's hard. Some of this stuff is hard. You have to like pronounce it a certain way, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know why I get so excited about these things. I'm a, I, I guess I'm a little bit strange, but that's okay. All right. Part one. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth, stoppeth one of three. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now whereforth stoppest thou me? The bridegroom's doors are open wide, and I am next of kin. My guests are met, the feast is set, mayest hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, gray beard loon, is Stufith's hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye, the wedding guest stood still, and li listens like a three years child, the mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone, he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop, below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea, higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon, the wedding guest here beat his breast, 
for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as rose is she, nodding their heads before her goes, the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his oath a taking wings and chased us south along. With slopping mask, mass and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe, and forward he bends his head. The ship drove fast, the loud roared the blast, and the southward eye we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, it grew wondrous cold, and ice my hast came floating by as green as emerald. And though the drifts, the snowy cliffs did set the dismal sheen, nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. At length we did cross an albatross, through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name and ate the food it ne'er had ate, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. And a good south wind sprung up behind, the albatross did follow, and every day for food or play it came to the mariner's hollow. The mist or cloud on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine, while all the night through fog smoke white, glimmered with the white moonshine. God save thee, ancient mariner, from friends that plague thee thus. Why lookest thou with my cross bow? I shot the albatross. So that's literally the first part. <laughs> it's crazy. Okay, so to kind of recap what happened here. It's a wedding day for a man. And this ancient mariner comes out of nowhere and he's like, Hey, no, listen, you have to hear my story before you get married. So this man is like, oh, I don't want to hear your story. And the mariner is like, no, you gotta hear my story. So he starts with a story. <laughs> so he starts with a story. And the man's like, no, I don't want to hear your story. And he starts, anyways. And it starts with the ship. So the mariner is on a ship. The ship is going through a really, really crappy part of the world where it's icy. And there's ice and fog everywhere and he can't see where he's going. And in philosophy and in mythology and in like religions albatross when you're a mariner usually shows you the way to a land like birds will show you the way to a land because birds huddle close to lands so this albatross came to the ship's rescue while they were out in an area of ice and snow and <laughs> tough buckle you gotta hear it anyway <laughs> so this albatross came and helped the mariner out and it was showing them where they have to go, it was showing the ship where they have to go, essentially. And albatross in, like, old, old Christian religion is, like, um, a good soul. It's a good omen to have when you see an albatross, essentially. And it was helping show them the way, and the mariner, at the end there, shot the albatross. So a good omen came, and the mariner shot the good omen. You essentially know what's going to happen. Everything's going to go to shit after this. <laughs> so that's the tale so far. Guy's getting married. Mariner's like, no, you gotta hear my story. Story starts. Ship's going through a bad area. Albatross helps. Mariner shoots Albatross. Anyways. <laughs> that was part one. Yeah, which is a bad, bad thing. Don't shoot albatross. Come on. You know better. <laughs> Alright, so the second part here. Part two. The sun now rose upon the right. Out of the sea came he. Still hid in mist, and on the left he went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow. Nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done a hellish thing, 
and it would work imo. For all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. A wretch, they said, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow. Nor dim nor red like God's own head, the glorious sun up uprist. Then all averred I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. Tis right they say such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew and the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, twas sad as sad could be, and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, and nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O Christ, that ever this should be. Yes, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burned green and blue and white. And in some dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so, nine fathom deep he followed us from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak nor more if we had been choked with soot. A well, a well a day, what evil looks, had I from old and young, instead of cross the albatross, around my neck was hung. So in the next part here, it's essentially just describing the area. Once he killed the albatross, the fog and the mist and everything surrounding them just went dead. The water went dead. The wind went dead. They were no longer moving. Stranded. That's what happens when you kill the albatross. Now you know. Don't kill birds. <laughs> Alright. Part 3. There passed a weary time. Each throat was parched and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time. How glazed each weary eye. When looking westward I beheld a something in the sky. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a miss. It moved and moved, and look, took at last a certain shape I wist. A speck, a miss, a shape I wist, and still it neared and neared. As if it dodged a water sprite, it plunged and trapped and veered. With throats unslacked and black lips backed, we could no longer laugh or wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood, I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried, a sail, a sail. With throats unslacked, with black lips backed, agape they heard me call, Gramercy, which means a flash of joy, for they joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in, they were drinking all. See, see, I cried, she tacks no more, hither to work us wheel. Without a breeze, without a tide, she steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame, and the day was nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad, bright sun. With a strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. And straight the sun was flecked with bars, heaven's mother send us grace. As if through dungeon grate he peered, with a broad and burning face. Alas, I thought, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears, all those her sails that glance in the sun like restless grossomeres. Are those her ribs through the sun? Did she peer as though a great? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? Are there two? Is death a woman's mate? 
Her lips were red, her look was f were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin as white as leprosy. The nightmare life in death was she, who thicks man's blood with cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she and whistles thrice. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out. At one stride comes the dark, with far heard whisper o'er the sea, off the sharp spark bark. We listened and looked up sideways. <laughs> wow. We listened and looked sideways up, fear at my heart uh, as at a cup. My lifeblood seemed to sip. The stars were dim, and the thick the night, the steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white. From the sails the drew dip did drip, till comb above the eastern bar, the horned moon with one bright star within the nether trip. One by one, by the star dog moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang, and cursed me with his eye. For times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan, with heavy thump, a lifeless, lifeless lump, they dropped one down by one by one. The souls did from their bodies fly, they fled to bliss or woe, and every soul it passed me by, like a whiz of my crossbow. <laughs> Story time is actually super relaxing during work. Oh, nice. <laughs> Maybe I'll do this more often during the day then. I always like reading stories. <laughs> Look in the mirror. All right, so in this next section here, essentially, what's happening is it's getting worse. So for a long, long time, the ship was very still. Nothing was moving. Everyone was, you know, just sitting there. Some people do it. Oh, they put it under a... I didn't know ASMR was a thing. I should do that. <laughs> Instead of just chatting, I should move this into ASMR. <laughs> mm, maybe I'll do that then. <laughs> All right. So in this verse here, everything is still for a very, very long time. You mod for an ASMR partner. Ooh, cool. Would this be accepted there? <laughs> and eventually what's happening is Lady Death has come. And she is claiming all of the crew on the ship. And there's about 50 men, and she takes all of them. I really like how they uh, explain Lady Death in this area. <laughs> Lady Death is neat. So in the so that was part three. So part four is gonna get a little bit interesting because I don't know how it works in poets or in English literature exactly, but usually with this particular poem, it's rhyming. So it's four lines. Um, with every other line rhyming, right? So you have, um, you know, fly and by, for example. So the souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe. And every soul had passed me by like a whiz of my crossbow. So like every, every one rhymes. But in this next part, part four, it changes up the tone or the speed of the poem. So now we're getting into five lines. And it's really weird. I don't know. From here on out, it gets harder to read, which is actually quite fun. <laughs> Poetry is so interesting. How it can like trip up people. And it, it, it makes you actually think about what you're reading. <laughs> yeah, skin as white as leprosy. <laughs> right? Lady Death. Jeez. It, instead of white as snow, like white as snow is beautiful. Snow white. Princessy. Lady Death, skin as white as leprosy. You know, uh, you know it's an old time when leprosy is, you know, still being brought up. <laughs> All right, part four. It's gonna get harder to read. Hold on, let me check my email quick. 
Oh, hold on, I might have to respond to this one quickly on the side here. Da 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 da. Oh, okay. Oh no, that's for tomorrow. Perfect. I can, I can deal with that tomorrow. There we go. I just gotta make sure. <laughs> well, it was written in the late 19, 1790s. Why, why does my brain do this? <laughs> I always go 1917. For whatever reason, my dumbass brain sees 1917 instead of 1790. I don't know why my brain does that. It's very odd. All right. All right, next part, next number. <sighs> so in this next part, it's going to switch roles. So we ended with the Mariner talking about Lady Death and the spirit that came and took away everyone. So now we're going to switch into this um, area and it's gonna be lading dyslexia with numbers possibly, who knows? Probably. Um, and it's going to be the, the lady talking to the ancient mariner now. So that's why the, the change up in the poem. So the mariner is telling his poem and now because the lines are getting a little bit weirder and a little bit harder to read, now it's a different person, Lady Death, talking to the mariner. All right. So it says, I fear, I fear thee, ancient mariner. I fear thy skinny hand. And thou art long and lank and brown, as is the ripped sea, band, sea sand. I fear thee and thy glittering eye, and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest, this body dropped, not drown. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on a soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all did dead did lie. They all dead did lie. A thousand thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as rust. I closed my lids and kept them closed, and the balls like pulses beat. For the sky and sea, and the sea and the sky, lay like a road on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they. The look for which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in the dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse, and yet it could not die. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams be mocked the sultry main, like April hoar hot hoarfrost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt away, and still an awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared the elfish light, fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue grassy green and velvet black, they coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy living things, no tongue, their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Good area timed, part five. Good morning. It was a big book. Good morning, Rex. Oh, everyone's awake now. <laughs> All right. Oh goodness, now Coco is getting going. 
Everyone's getting going here. <laughs> So that was pretty fun. Just more describing. Oh, Coco. She might get a little bit noisy, sorry guys. All right, so, essentially what happened there is the mariner, the, the lady's talking to the mariner and she's like, I don't like you. I don't like that you killed the albatross. That's a bad thing. And she's like, ew, you're slimy and you're skinny and I <laughs> <laughs> thou art long and lank and brown. That's essentially how she describes the mariner. He's he's very tanned from being out in the sun, from being on a ship out in the sun all day, every day. A little bit of noise in the background, sorry guys. Alright. So. The mariner is the only one left on the ship, and it's a ghost ship now. And... Essentially what happens is he lets the albatross go back into the sea and it sinks down. So he's essentially trying to like pay back this lady for giving the albatross, uh, by giving the albatross back. All right. <laughs> pets will be pets. <laughs> yeah. I love my pets. I love my Rexy. Okay. So part five. Oh yeah, this whole entire time, this mariner is just living. Well, like, he's dead, but he's living, if that makes sense. Imagine... Imagine not being able to do anything. Imagine never being hungry, but you're hungry. But you can't eat, but you don't have to eat. And imagine being tired, but not needing sleep. But you're still tired. Ima like, you're dead, but you're not dead. You're just existing. What a terrible thing. Right in the morning. <laughs> That's essentially what the Mariner is going through. He's existing without actually existing. That's a crazy concept. <laughs> kind of like me right now. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. That's a great concept. Like, I'm just, I'm just working through life right now. I'm working through work. I'm at work, but I'm not actually working. <laughs> hold, hold on, quick second here. I think I think it's so fascinating. So part five, we're two parts away from the finishing of this. <laughs> All right. Oh, sleep is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. To Mary Queen, the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. The silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained. I dreamt they were filled with dew, and when I woke, it rained. My lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments were all dank. Sure I had drunken in my dreams, and still my body drank. I moved and I could not feel my limbs. I was so light and almost, I thought that I died in my sleep, and, blessed, and was a blessed ghost. And soon I heard the roaring wind, it did not come anear, but with its sound, it shook the sails that were so thin and sere. The upper air burst into life and a hundred fire flags sheen. To and fro they were hurried about, to and fro and in and out. The wan stars danced between. 
And the coming wind did roar more loud, and the sails did sigh like sedge. And the rain poured down from one black cloud. The moon was at its edge. The, flick, the thick black cloud was cleft, and still the moon was at its side. Like water shot from some high crag, the lightning fell with never a jag, a river steep and wide. The loud wind never reached the ship, and yet, the, yet now the ship move on. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead man gave a groan. They groaned and stirred, and they all uprose, nor spake nor moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. The mariners all again worked the ropes where they were wont to do. The, they raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me knee to knee. The body I pulled at one rope, but he said not to me. I fear thee, ancient mariner, be calm thou wedding guest. Twas not those souls that fled in pain, which to their corpses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. For when at dawn they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast, sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. Around, around flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes a dropping from the sky, I heard the skylark sing. Sometimes all the little birds that are, how they sim seem to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. And now twas like all instruments, now like a lonely flute, and now it is an angel's song that makes the heavens be mute. It ceased yet still the sails made on, a pleasant noise till noon, a noise like all hidden brook in the leafy month of June, that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune. Till noon we quietly sailed on, yet never a breeze did breathe. Slowly and smoothly went the ship, moved onward from beneath. Under the keel, nine fathom deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit sled, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left their tune, and the ship stood still also. The sun right up above the mast had fixed her to the ocean. But in a minute she gan stir, with a short uneasy motion, backwards and forwards half her length, with a short uneasy motion. Then, like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. It flung the blood into my head, and I fell down into a swound. How long in that same fit I lay, I have not to declare. But ere my living life returned, I heard in my soul discerned two voices in the air. Is it he, quoth one? Is this the man? By him who died on cross, with his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross. The spirit who biddeth by himself in the land of mist and snow, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. The other was a softer voice, as soft as honeydew. Quoth he, the man hath penance done, and the penance more will do. I like that. So essentially, because he returned the albatross back, and he, he paid his penance. <laughs> I can see Rex laying up here. <laughs> the uh, ship started to move again. It's interesting. And like uh, dead men worked with him. I don't know why they uh, they're not there. So actually, that's an interesting concept. Um, all the men who died weren't bound the same way the mariner was. So the mariner and his crew all died because they killed the albatross, but only the mariner remained to like haunt the ship. All of the rest of the crew left. Which is neat. Like, the crew died, 
and they went to heaven because they had nothing to do with the albatross. So they were saved while the mariner was like living as hell over and over again. It's kind of fun. Wakes up, lays back down, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a lucky dog. He just sleeps all day. It's so nice. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I was a dog, that's for sure. <laughs> But imagine, yeah, imagine being helped by a crew that's no longer your crew because they all died and they weren't bound like you were. <laughs> easy life. Yeah, dogs have an easy life. That's for sure. All right. Did I read this already? Yeah, I read that. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Part six. So this is going to flip between a first voice and a second voice, and it, I, I'm going to try to like point it out, but like at the beginnings of these, it, it says first voice and second voice. Um, so it's two people talking to each other, essentially. So let's see. First voice. But tell me, tell me, speak again, my soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Second voice. Still as a slave before his lord, the ocean hath no blast. His great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast. If he may know which way to go, for she guides him smooth or grim. See, brothers, see how graciously she looketh down on him. First voice. But why drives that ship so fast without wave or wind? Second. The air is cut away before and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly, more high, more high, or we shall be bladed. For slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated. I woke and we were sailing on as in a gentle weather. Twas night, calm night, the moon was high, and the dead men stood together. All stood together on a deck for channel dungeon fitter. All fix on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter, the pang, the curse with which they died, they never had never passed away. I could not dry my eyes from theirs, nor turn them up to pray. And now the spell was snapped once more, I viewed the ocean green, and looked far forth, yet little saw of what had else had been seen. I'm hungry, what do you suggest? Um, tea and a cookie. At least that's what I'm eating. I have my cookie here. And I have my tea as well. That's what I suggest. <laughs> no worries. Welcome, cells. <laughs> like one on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round on walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread, but soon be weathered a wind on me, nor sound nor motion made, its path was not upon the sea, in a ripple or in shade. It raised my hair, it fanned my cheek, like a meadow gale of spring, it mangled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet sa she sailed softly too, sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze, on me alone it blew. Oh, dream of joy, is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? We drifted o'er the harbor bar, and I with sobs did pray, Oh, let me be awake, my God, or let me sleep away. The harbor bay was clear as glass, so smoothly it was strewn, and on the bay the moonlight lay, and the shadow of the moon. The rock shone bright, the kirk no less, that stands above the rock, the moonlight steeped in silent less, the steady weathercock. And the bay was white with, violent, <laughs> with silent light, till rising from the same, full many shapes the shadows were, and crimson colors came. A little distance from the prow those crimson shadows were, I turned my eyes upon the deck, O Christ, what I saw there. Each corpse lay flat, lifeless and flat, 
and by the holy rood, a man all light and saffrous man, on every corpse there stood. The saffrous band each waved his hand. It was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, each one a lovely light. The seraph band each waved his hand. No voice did they impart. No voice but oh, the silence sank like music on my heart. But soon I heard the dash of oars, I heard the pilot's cheer. My hand was turned performance way, and I saw a boat appear. The pilot and the pilot's boy, I heard them coming fast. Dear Lord in heaven, it was a joy. The dead men could not blast. I saw a third, I heard his voice, it is the hermit good. He singeth loud the godly hymns that makes him in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul, he'll wash away the albatross's blood. All right, so the ship's just getting back to the to the shore here. Albatross is helping the Mariner get his ship back, but everyone's dead, which is interesting. Everyone's dead. What the fuck? <laughs> All right. Part seven. Last part. <laughs> All right. This hermit good lives in that wood, which slopes down to the sea. How lone, loudly his sweet voice he rears. He loves to talk with the mariners that come from a far country. He keels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that woolly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared, I heard him talk. Why, this is strange, I trow. Where are those lights so many and fair that single made but now? Strange, but my faith, the hermit said, and they answered not out our cheer. The planks looked warped in those sails. How thin they are and sear. I never saw aught like to them unless perchance it were. My brown skeletons of leaves that lag, my forest brook along, when the ivy trod is heavy with snow, and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. Dear Lord, it hath a fiendish look, the pilot made reply. I am afeard, push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay. The ship went down like dead. Stunned by loud and dreadful sound, which sky and ocean smote like one hath been seven days drowned my body lay afloat but swift as dreams myself i found within the pilot's boat upon the whirl where sank ship the boat spun round and round and all was still save that hill was telling of the sound i moved my lips the pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit the holy hermit raised his eyes and a prayed where he did sit I took the oars, the pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, and laughed, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha ha, quoth he, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. And now, all in my own country, I stood on, a fir on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. O oh, shrieve me, O oh, shrieve me, holy man. The hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? Forthwith his this frame of mine as wenched with a woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. Since then, at an uncertain hour, the agony returns. Until my ghastly tale is told, this heart burns, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land i have strange power of speech that moment that his face i see i know the man that i that must hear me to tell to him my tale i teach what loud uproar bursts from the door the wedding guests are there but in the garden bower the bride and the bridesmaids singing are and hark little vesper bell which biddeth me to prayer a wedding guest, 
the soul hath been alone on a wide sea, so lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed to there to be. O oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, twas sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a godly company. To walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends, and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he madeth loveth all. The mariner whose eyes is bright, whose beard is age is hoar, is gone and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one from that hath been stunned, and is since forlorn, a sadder and wiser man who rose the morrow morn. And that's the end. That was a confusing ending. So essentially what happened in the ending here, the mariner got saved by two men rowing a boat in a harbor, and the men took him back to land, the boat that the mariner was on sank into the harbor, not to be seen again, <laughs> and he, the, the mariner, for some strange reason, had, like, beelined it to the wedding guest, which originally started his tale. So if we go back to the beginning, the mariner wanted to tell a per like, a guy who's getting married about his story. He absolutely had to tell him his story. And now we're getting back to the end, which started at the beginning. The story comes along, he gets off the boat. He makes a beeline for the wedding guest to tell him his story. Which is so interesting. Because it doesn't, like, in the book itself, like, the poem just ends. It doesn't give any follow-up as to why this poem was created. It doesn't, like, it doesn't tell you why anything happened here. But theories are... So one of the theories which I think is really cool, and this is like the philosophy playing into it, is that the mariner who was out at sea and killed the albatross was the guy who was getting married. And he wants to warn his former self not to kill the albatross. That's one of the theories anyways, which is pretty cool when you think about it. It's kind of like a time travel-y kind of thing happening then. Reminds me of backwards poem I read as a child. Oh, what's the backwards poem? I wonder if that one. <laughs> but yeah, it's like he's trying to go back to his former self to warn him, like, don't kill the albatross. So interesting. One bright day in the middle of the night, two dead boys got up to fight. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I like that. So yeah, that's the uh, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Back to back, they face each other. drew their swords and shot each other. Huh. What is that? Give me the, uh, give me the name of that. Maybe I'll read that next. That would be fun. <laughs> but yeah, that's the philosophy behind it. I think it's so cool. Deaf policemen heard the noise and came and shot the two dead boys. <laughs> deaf? Oh, that's an interesting one. A deaf policeman heard the noise. <laughs> I 
If you believe this lie is true, ask the blind man. He saw it too. <laughs> that is so interesting. I like that. But that was it. It was my fave. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's a... It, it's kind of like um, an older saying, like, I see, said the blind man, as he pick up his hammer and saw. <laughs> Loved it so much, I memorized it. <laughs> it's funny, when you like um, um, ha ryth ryth rhythms and rhymes are very easy to memorize, which is really cool because back in the day, not everyone had the money to produce a book or to produce a writing or to have um, education to produce writings, for example. So bards, poor, poor bards, memorized everything like if you think of the epic of beowulf for example maybe i'll read the next beowulf is really cool um bards didn't have the ability to write everything down and recite them they had to memorize them and the easiest way to remember stories was to make them rhyming or to make rhythm right so if you have a song you remember the rhythm. Like, I can think of 50 different songs right now in my head because of the rhythm of them. It's so much, like, that's how you remember. And the same thing with epics and tales like this. You remember the rhythms because of the flow of it. So poems are very, like, poems that you like are very easy to memorize because you like the poem, you like the rhythm of it. I like the rhythm of that too. One bright day in the middle of the night, to two dead boys got up to fight. Back to back they faced each other, drew their swords, and shot each other. Deaf policemen heard the noise and came and shot the two dead boys. If you believe this lie is true, ask the blind man he saw too. It's a fun one. <laughs> but it's little things like that where, like, bards would memorize epics poems would be memorized, songs would be memorized, and that's how you tell the history of things, is not because it was written down in history books, it's because it was passed on through tales. You don't remember who wrote it? That's okay. It's probably easy enough to, to look up on Google, or to, like, to look up in general. <laughs> hmm. But it's cool how people remember things. Like, I remember The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. I remember reading it back in university. I, I didn't exactly remember the whole entire thing. I remember the first part. You can see all my notes in it. <laughs> I think it's so cool how, um, how memory works that way, essentially. You, you remember the things when it comes to rhyming. Like, phone numbers. Um... As a kid, I remembered my phone number because of, like, a rhyme. As a kid, I remembered my address because of a rhyme. I remember how to spell my name because of, like, the tune to it. <laughs> At least when I was a kid. Like, we, um... So my nephew, Jace... An example of this is, um... Yeah, my nephew, Jace... We taught him, or like my brother taught him, how to remember how to spell his name by the rhyme. So he would say, J-A-C-E, Jace is my name, Jace is me. And that's how he got my nephew, at a young age, to, to know how to spell his name. <laughs> J-A-C-E, Jace is my name, Jace is me. It's, it's such a, an interesting mechanism to like teach teach people how to how to remember things but isn't it insane that like beowulf the epic of beowulf was memorized by bards like beowulf is insane i don't think i have it in this one i think it's in my other one but it, like beowulf itself is very 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 hard to read because it's old english Let's see if it's in here. I want to see. Old English is very hard to read. 
It has like a lot of thou and hath and all these like weird, weird, weird words. All right, so there's sonnets in here. I don't think Beowulf's in this one in particular. I think it's in my other one. Yeah, my other one is old. Hold on, let me get it. I'm gonna show you guys, cause like this one's thick. <laughs> my other one's thick. So this is my other, my other one, English literature. But this one's old English. Old English is fun. I fucking love old English. <laughs> I um, I wish I can show you guys. I wonder if there's a way to show you exactly. <laughs> a copy of War and Peace, yeah. <laughs> All right, this is a. Uh... Hold on, let me see if I can get it to focus. There we go. Alright, so, if only my light wasn't so bright, but there's like some weird ass words in here. It actually might be flip for you guys, I can't really tell if it's flip or not. But, um, here we go. Oops, back that up a little bit more. There we go. <laughs> yeah, it's flipped. It's all flipped for you guys. So in here is Beowulf. Oh, there's, there's another fun poem in here. Um, the Shepherd's Play is fun. But to kind of give you an idea of what would be in this one, let me find a, a good, see if I can find Beowulf in here. It's a huge book. Should be easy though. <gasps> D Higgy, DJ Higgy, hey, how are ya? Wow, why did I say D Higgy? <laughs> oh, DJ. DJ Higgy. How are you doing this morning? This one's the Fairy Queen. So, okay, let me put it this way. Queen, for example, is Q-U-E-E-N in our language, but Queen in Old English has an E at the end. They spell things by how they sound. Hmm. Oh, look, I have a receipt in here. That's a bookmark for something. <laughs> this is Volpum, Duchess of Melfi, Love Made in the First Age, Paradise Lost. I might read some of these just because they're so much fun to read. <laughs> um. So the one that I'm thinking of, it actually might be in my other book. Let me just check though. Beggar's Opera. But Old English in, in general is just like really, really hard to read because everything is pronounced how it's written in Old English. So like the poems in here, you literally have to like sound it out. I'm great, how are you doing this morning? Oh, that's good. I'm good, thank you. Starting my starting my morning with like, um, trying to use my brain this morning. <laughs> it's working. I like using my brain sometimes. Okay, let me flip over everything here. Da -da -da. Da -da -da. But it's all poems. And that's how... Oh, Wife, Wife of Bath. Wife of Bath is a fun one. Maybe I'll do that one next. Sounds like you're about to read a Shem Shakespeare. I actually just finished reading. <laughs> I, um, we did the Mariner's Rhyme this morning. The Mariner's Rhyme is really fun. Um, it's a fun little tale. Just to recap for those who are joining. <laughs> Yeah, the rhyme of the ancient mariner. 
not as old as Shakespeare. Shakespeare would be fun. I have um, not Shakespeare, but I do have old books on Socrates and Plato. And Socrates had a lot of fun tales. I think those would be a lot of fun to read. Camera's out of focus again. This way, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Socrates is a lot of fun to read. And Plato. They have, um, so I don't remember which philosopher it was, but um, one of them had the story of the cave. I'm pretty sure it was Plato. I'm gonna have to double check though. So one of these philosophers had a, a story of the <laughs> myth of playing Assassin's Creed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's right, an Odyssey. So um, I believe it. I believe it was Plato. It might have been Socrates. I could be mixing up my philosophers here, but one of them had. It's called the uh, the the allegory of the cave, and essentially what it is is like. There's all these people who live in a cave. I'm pretty sure it's Socrates now I'm thinking about it. Um, imagine being born in a cave. And all you know is anything to do with this cave. You don't know anything else possibly exists except for this cave, for example. And when you're in this cave, when you're born in this cave, you're immediately tied up. And you live tied up in the same place for all your life, and you're forced to watch shadows, for example. So there's a fire behind you, and from that fire, it's project projecting shadows in front of you. So these shadows are projecting things. Yeah, the allegory of the cave. Uh, Plato's cave. Thank you. It was Plato. Thank you. Google. Thank you, Google. <laughs> I kept flipping between the two. I'm like, it's either Socrates or Plato. Thank you. <laughs> so imagine being tied up with fire behind you, projecting shadows onto a cave wall. So this is Plato's, Plato's, now that we know, <laughs> analogy of the cave, where a person born is watching the shadows on the cave. That's all they've ever known are these shadows on the cave wall. So you don't know anything. No one else is around you. You don't know other people exist. All you know is everything to be on these shadows on the wall. And then one day, let's say 15 years later, for example, this person gets let out of the cave and they get to see everything that's outside of the cave. So it's actually really, really cool because it's kind of an analogy for how people live currently. Like, you know the phrase, we live under a rock? It kind of comes from that concept where you're brought up in a cave, you only know what you know. And then when something else is presented to you, you, have, you don't believe it. So like if somebody from the outside world came into the cave and told you, hey, you know what, there's, there's real green grass out there. You gotta see this grass, it's real cool. You're gonna sit there and say, no, there's no grass. Grass doesn't exist because all you know is what's been around you your whole entire life, which is such a cool concept. You don't know grass exists because you've been tied up in a cave your entire life. <laughs> yeah, what's grass? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's such a cool concept. Yeah. So, yeah, I actually I maybe I'll I'll pull some um cuz I have some books on on Greek mythology and I have some books on Plato and Socrates and and the Greek philosophies. They are cool as fuck. Like, Plato is cool as fuck. Like, the, uh, the concepts behind it are amazing. When you do experience it, it will be fascinating to you. Yeah. Or you'll be closed off, right? It's just kind of like one of those things where... 
some people will be open to the idea of grass. <laughs> Other people won't be open to that idea. Other will people be like, no, grass doesn't exist. I don't want to acknowledge that grass exists. That's kind of like how people are now. Greek mythology is quite interesting. Yeah, I love Greek mythology. I love how when you're talking about, not specifically um, Greek mythology, just as in like, you know, you can have the epics and the ballads of, of Achilles, for example, um, and some of the other, uh, 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 Hercules as well, Heracles, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Some people say it's Hercules. Some people will say it's Heracles. <laughs> There's all these really cool ballads. But like the Greek gods themselves are really cool too. Um, I love how each of them have their own backstory and their own personality. Like, uh, in one of the stories that I read during university, Zeus turns himself into a swan to seduce a, a lady. He also turns himself into a bull to seduce another lady. And actually, the bull one is how Heracles came about. He was born from Zeus being a bull and, and raping somebody. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, the story of Hera. Hera is a really cool goddess. Um, Persephone. Persephone? Persephone? I don't really know how to pronounce that one. R Persephone? Something like that. Really cool story with her and Hades. Really, really cool story about how the god of death fell in love with, like, the god of spring. Really cool. So maybe I'll do a little bit of that. I find those things interesting. <laughs> but, yeah. That's essentially what I went through, like, university for, was, like, all these, like, old English books. Reading philosophies from way back when. Um... Buddhism and Taoism, they have like really cool books as well. Like uh, I read to Ian a few a few months ago now, I think it would have been um, in our in a in, a, in my Taoist book, there's like the story of like how a really, really old guy was able to keep his knife sharp the whole entire time of his life because he every time he cut meat, he just allowed it to glide through the meat instead of forcing it. Whereas young chefs will force their knife, for example, and they have to like resharpen their knife and their knife gets dull and then eventually they have to buy a new knife. But if you just let things be and let it glide how you want, you can keep your knife forever. There's little stories like that where it's like kind of life lessons <laughs> embedded in it. <laughs> But yeah, the the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It's kind of a life lesson in that. Don't kill don't kill birds while you're out on the water. It's a bad omen. <laughs> Plato was ahead of his time. Plato was ahead of his time. Socrates was ahead of his time. These guys were ahead of their time. I, I think I'm gonna do that next. Like in a, in another stream, I think I might. I might read some of their stories. Because they are hella cool. <laughs> and then that could be my me morning time. Just reading cool stories. And then, if you guys want to join, that's fine. I'm going to read them anyways. Because <laughs> they're so cool. Hmm. Anyways. I, I, I don't know. I really like them. I want to read more Greek mythology. I think Greek mythology would be really cool to read. I want to read, um, what is this one? Volume one. Testicles, whose uncle was stuff. Yeah. Whose uncle was Socrates. I don't know much about like lineage or anything like that, but I do, I do recognize the name Testicles. Mr. Go with your gut. <laughs> I have, um, where is my Greek? I think my Greek mythology book might be in storage. <laughs> oh, what is that emoji? That's a cool one. A little heart. <laughs> um, 
ba, da, da, ba. So I think I might do those. That would be really fun. I also want to read Beowulf now, too. Beowulf would be fun. I don't know. Maybe we'll do some Greek, and then maybe we'll do some, some Beowulf. <gasps> I also want to read, um, mm, who was it? Achilles, who went on, like, a really great, great epic. Achilles has a cool story, too. So maybe we'll do him. I don't know. I am, like, fired up. There's all these cool things I want to do now. <laughs> That's different from the video game. I can leave video games to the evening and all these cool readings in the morning. That would be fun. I think I'll do that. I don't know if you guys are down for that, but I'm down for that. Let's see. Let's see if I can find Be Beowulf. Nightingale's Nest, Prometheus Unbound, uh, Alastor, oh, Don Juan. <gasps> Don Juan is so cool. Have you guys heard? You Okay. You guys must have heard of Don Juan. Right? He is. He is. The ladies man. He's able to seduce any lady he wants. Don Juan. There's, um... I have a story in here. I know you guys won't be able to see it, but... Uh, his, uh... Let's see. Let's see how long his story is. So his, his story is broken up into two parts. He has Canto 1 and Canto 2. Don Giovanni. Not the same. Oh, no, he has four. He has four cantos. And his story is about 50 pages long. So it's it's a pretty it's a pretty thick chunk of the book here for Don Juan. He's pretty cool. If you guys if you guys get the chance, look up Don Juan. Maybe we'll read that one too. Yeah. He was like a giant philanthropist, Don Juan. Huge drinker. Huge gambler. Huge ladies man. He was cool. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll do that we'll do some Greek we'll do some Don Juan we'll do some Beowulf that's another name Don Juan goes by oh Don Giovanni oh interesting I didn't know that is that like the uh, <laughs> is that the Italian one Giovanni Mafia kind of name. Let's see. Let's see if I can read a little bit about it first. So we have like a, a little tale on Don Juan here. I don't know why I keep saying his first and last name, Don. <laughs> Byron began his masterpiece pronounced in the English fashion, Don Juan, July 1818. Actually, it is the Italian version. Oh, cool. Oh, so Don Giovanni is the Italian version of this. Like a translation then. That's cool. <laughs> Published in installments beginning with the cantos 1 and 2 in 1819 and continued working on it almost until his death. Initially, he improvised the poem from episode to episode. Imagine being so good at writing, you just like improvise the whole entire time. That's essentially how writing works. <laughs> um, I have no plan, he said. I had no plan, but I had uh, or have materials. The work was composed with remarkable speed. The 888 lines of the Canto 13, for example, were dashed off within a week. And it aims at the effect of impro improvisation rather than the artful compression. It asks to be read rapidly at a conversational pace. Okay. So when I'm reading this to you guys, I'm going to have to read it, like, conversationally. Poem breaks off with the 16th canto, but even in its unfinished state, Don Juan is the longest satirical poem, and indeed one of the longest poems of any kind in English. 
Its hero, the Spanish Libertine, had in the original legend been superhuman in his sexual energy and wickedness. <laughs> Don Giovanni Opera by Lorenzo da Ponte and Wolfgang Animus Mozart. Oh. I, I know there's operas about it. I know there's like, um, there's plays and operas surrounding this whole story, which is cool. Huh. I have to look that up. I'll have to look up more about this. Okay. The controlling element of Don Juan is not the narrative, but the narrator. His running commentary on Juan's misadventures, his reminiscences, and his opinionated remarks on the approach of political reaction in which he actually telling Juan's story together add another level to the poem's engagement with history. The narrator's reflections also at the same time lend unity to Don Juan's everescent variety. Tellingly, the poem opens with the first person pronoun and immediately lets us into the storyteller's predicament. I want a hero. I need a hero. <laughs> the voice then goes on for almost 2,000 stanzas with effortless vol volubility to shift the mood. The poet, who in his brilliant successful use created the gloomy Byronic hero, in his later and sadder life created character, who is one of the great comic inventions in literature, English literature, was this. Mozart's outrageous comedy tells the tale of an incorrigible young playboy who blazes the path to his own destruction in a single day. Based on the story of Don Juan, Don Giovanni follows an irresistible yet irresponsible and amoral youth who is loved by women almost university as he loves them. See? I told you, he's a huge playboy. Don Juan's huge playboy. OG English playboy. <laughs> Okay, based on the story of Don Juan, Don Giovanni follows. Okay, so it's kind of a, a little bit of a spin-off. Mozart, I didn't know Mozart wrote comedy. Wait, are we talking about the, no, we're, we're talking about Wolfgang Mozart. Right, right. <laughs> the real classical music, yeah. <laughs> I enjoy, um, I do really enjoy classical music. I enjoy, um, I enjoy, uh, the sounds of classical music, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know any specific musicians who are classical. Mozart, obviously, is one of them. Bach for example, is another one. Um, I couldn't name any songs by them whatsoever, though. But it's nice to listen to. I also enjoy, and this is controversy, not everyone's going to agree with this, Beethoven, yeah, Beethoven's another one. Um, not everyone will agree with this, but I do also enjoy modern day music being put into classical. I admire how musicians can take modern day sounds and still produce them with classical uh, with classical tones, like flutes. Flutes are cool. Harps, violins, so cool how you can still get the same beat and tone and everything like that just classical sounding it's so cool so cool um there's a is it the the two cellos the two cellos um very cool band very very cool classical artists two cellos create amazing modern day music um, there's also one with pianos, too. Piano, the Piano Boys or something like that? Piano Brothers, maybe? 
they're dueling pianists who play a lot of classical music, or not classical music, uh, modern day cl in classical. Um, but two cellos, really cool. Love their music. Love how they can take anything modern and make it feel really nice. <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. It's so interesting. I'm not a history buff by any means. Um, it's just, it's literature. Literature and philosophy is where I fall into. History, I don't like to memorize dates, can't memorize dates for the life of me, but give me ballads, give me poems, give me stories, I love those. 10 out of 10, we'll read them every time. <laughs> Ugh, history, I don't like history. I can't memorize dates, I can't memorize people, I don't know people's names. But I remember the stories. I remember the stories around them. I couldn't tell you what Stalin did or what he was known for. But if you give me a story around Stalin, hell yeah, I'll read it. <laughs> History and hair -tory. Hmm. If you give me an epic ballad around Stalin, mm, I'd read an epic ballad about Stalin. <laughs> anyways so yeah i think i'll do that in my um well obviously in my evening streams i'll stick to video games i'll still play assassin's creed and like my typical video games that i would normally play but in the mornings i think i'm gonna switch i'm gonna switch to just reading because it's cool it's fun <laughs> hmm all right well in that case i think for now, it's almost 10.30 my time, so I'm going to start to look at some more emails and stuff that I might have missed over the hour, and I will probably be live tonight to play Assassin's Creed. Do you play any instruments? I do. I play the flute. Um, I haven't played the flute in years, but I do play, I play the flute, um, I play the piano, or used to, I don't think I can anymore. Um, I was starting to learn violin and guitar, but, you know, video games took precedence over that. <laughs> but the flute, I've played the flute for about 15 years now. Um, absolutely my favorite instrument. Piano and sax, nice. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't played for a few years either, but I've played the flute for so long that if I picked it up again, it's kind of like riding a bike. It might take me, you know, a few scales just to get used to it again, but I feel like I would get used to it again. Learning the guitar, nice. The guitar is a beautiful instrument. I love it, especially metal. I have mad respect for metal players, for metal guitarists, because you're not just strumming the same tune over and over again. In metal, you have your solos. The solos are like the coolest rips ever. <laughs> I can listen to music, yeah. <laughs> you have good ears for that. <laughs> no, no, you're good. I like talking, don't worry. <laughs> Gives me another thing to talk about, that's for sure. Oh, Ian plays, Ian plays metal guitar. Or like, well, not... He, pl he plays a lot of rock songs and long metal, and it's really cool. I, I love listening to it. I love it. Metal is so cool. Metal bands are so cool. <laughs> acoustic is really cool too. I love acoustic guitar. Both, both unique in their own ways. Banjo, banjo is like a small guitar, very cool. Bass. Bass I can't really get into. Davey 504, though, plays really good bass. <laughs> if you're on YouTube, check out Davey 504 for sure. Very cool. Very epic. <laughs> um, but yeah. Music, music's been in our family for a while. So music is very important. <laughs> Don't think I've heard an instrument I haven't loved the sound of. Yeah. 
for me, it's trombone. Trombone can go fuck itself. I don't know. And trumpets. Uh, no, trumpets can sound pretty cool. It's the trombones. I don't, I don't care for trombones. <laughs> That's just me. I don't like them. I don't know why. They're not cool. But I love every other instrument. Every other instrument is good. Even on their own. Trombones are the only ones. Clarinets? Mm, no, I like clarinets. Clarinets are fine. Saxophones are fine. Every other instrument is fine. Not trombones. <laughs> I don't know why. They're just too... Eh. Nuh, 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 nuh. I don't know. I don't know. Just not my thing, I guess. <laughs> okay. Alright then. Clicked and expected to hear Iron Maiden. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Iron Maiden's nice. Maybe I should do that next time. The next time, oh, when I'm playing, or, or like, sorry, yeah, when I'm playing like my next video game, um, maybe I'll have metal music on in the background. That'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> like a, a war zone with metal. Oh, that would just be hectic. We're running around trying to shoot people, and then you have like this loud metal music in the background, just like absolutely. <laughs> Why is the rhyme not referencing the Maiden song? No, it's not. <laughs> Do they have? Oh, that just clicked. Do they have? Hold on, hold on. Does Iron Maiden? I'm sorry, this is just... They do! <gasps> you are... Oh my god. <gasps> sorry, I'm just looking this up for the first time. Yeah, I was reading the 17th... Yeah, I was, I was reading an old, old, old poem. I was reading the original poem, which Iron Maiden made their song off of I don't know hold on I don't know if I'm gonna get copyright striked for this hold on give me a quick second here this is cool this is cool before I log off hold on this is cool hold on this is cool <laughs> Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner are very, very obviously they, they took it from the, the old epic poem, but it's the old epic poem, just in their own words. Right? Hear the rhyme of the ancient mariner, see his eye as he stops one of three, memorizes one of the wedding guests, stay here and listen to the nightmares of the sea. That's essentially what they do in the beginning, is like they stop the wedding guests and they're like, hey. Listen, listen to my song. And the music plays on, the bride passes by, caught by his spell, the mariner tells his tale, driven south to the land of snow and ice, to a player, place where nobody's seen. Through the snow, fog flies on the albatross, hailed in God's name, hoping good luck it brings. So there's the albatross, comes in and saves them, right? 
So cool. What? And the ship sails on back to the north through the fog and ice and the albatross follows on. Mariner kills the bird of good omen. His shipmates cry against what he's done, but when the fog clears, they justify him and make themselves part of the crime. Sailing on and on, north across the sea, sailing on and on, north till all is calm. The albatross begins with its vengeance, a terrible curse, a thirst has begun. His shipmates blame bad luck on the mariner. About his neck, the dead bird is hung. This is for, like, pretty much, it is like, it's not word for word, but it's, it's getting all the verses in there. That is, I'm sorry. Vader shake. Thank you. How epic is that? Yeah, they did the same thing with whiskey in, in the jar. Yeah. Metallica did something very similar. All, um, oh, 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 I'm sorry. All metal people, all metal artists take from an epic poem, right? I don't know if you guys have heard the one off, but there's Trogdor. Trogdor was a man. He was an angry man. <laughs> That's a metal song. Trogdor. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, Beowulf, I'm pretty sure, has been made into... Yeah, Trogdor! <laughs> um, Beowulf, I'm pretty sure, has been made into a, a metal song. Um, any old English... Any old English um, poem that was popular through the ages, I'm pretty sure has been made into a into a, a metal song. How fucking cool is that? How cool is that? Like I just read like a, a poem from 1790, and I had I it didn't occur to me that a metal artist, Iron Maiden, made it into a cool ass rock song. My mind is absolutely blown right now. Thank you, Vader Shake. Absolutely blown. You are correct. So cool. I'm glad I stayed on this extra 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm so happy I stayed on this extra 20 minutes. This is the coolest thing ever, right? It makes me want to like reread that poem again to myself to be like, yeah, this is like an Iron Maiden song. Yeah, hardcore storytelling. It's true. Um, pretty much any metal artist does hardcore storytelling. Um, there's um, there's a, a folklore. There's a folklore band. I'm also thinking of. I don't. They're not metal by any means, but they're more folklore. Um, the tale of the Edmund Fitzgerald. That was a really cool poem. Uh made into a folklore song. Very cool. Grendel. Yep. Yeah. Closest. Well, Grendel is kind of in Beowulf. It's one of the scenes in Beowulf. Um, Grendel, Grendel is a character within Beowulf. So yeah, I mean, it's not the whole entire tale of Beowulf, but it is telling of, of one character that is heavily involved in Beowulf. That's so cool. Isn't that so cool? I love metal. I love metal music. <laughs> I love metal artists. I don't know. That's so cool. <laughs> the Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald is really cool. Marillion did that song back in 83. How old is Beowulf? Beowulf's like 1700s, I think. 1800s? I think it, one of, um, maybe even earlier. I'm gonna have to look it up. I have to consult my books or Google. Google's faster. Yeah, Gordon Lightfoot. Hmm. He knew a lot of the guys who were lost in that wreck. Oh, that's interesting. Very interesting. The, um, so my hometown sits between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And The Wreck of the Edmunds Fitzgerald was a huge song in our area. Um, 
just because like I literally lived right in between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. You drive 20 minutes either way, you're at Lake Erie, you're at Lake Ontario. And um, town's called Welland and it has like a canal connecting Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And like it was, it's mentioned in there. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember the lines to it. It's like um, something Lake Ontario sends in what Lake Erie can send her. Farther below Lake Ontario takes in what Lake Erie can send her, or something like that, is one of the the lines in it. I'm like, yeah. Lake Ontario sends in what Lake Lake Erie, through the canals, feeds water to Lake Ontario. Cool. (laughs) Um, My dad also works on a lot of ships. Over the pond near Cleveland. Nice. They're not too far away at all. (laughs) Not too far away at all. (laughs) But it's so cool. Like, I love love folklore. I love tales like that. I think that's what brings communities together. It's the coolest thing ever. (laughs) Um... Yeah, my uh, my dad works on ships, and it's the same thing. Like that's a Gordon Lightfoot makes his way around all of the shippers. <laughs> it's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Gotta head out for work. Well, thanks for stopping in, Higgy. I'm really happy you made it. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna be heading out shortly here too as well. I gotta, I gotta answer some emails. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit of research on my end and I'm probably going to read, um, in the morning, 20 minutes from Lake Erie and one hour from Lake Huron. <laughs> the lakes are so cool. I, that's one of the things that I'm really proud of being in the area that I'm in, like within Ontario, we have like three access to three or four of the Great Lakes. It's the coolest thing ever. Coolest thing ever. I swam in Lake Erie. I swam in Lake Ontario. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Lake Erie is better to swim in than Lake Ontario, but I wouldn't recommend swimming in Lake Ontario. It's nasty. Pollution from everyone. Pollution from Hamilton, mainly. (laughs) But, yeah, I think I'm going to do a little bit of research. We'll probably, uh, in the morning, um, read read some Greek mythology. Maybe we'll do a little bit of Plato and Socrates. I think that would be cool. And then in the evenings, I'll stick to my video games. We'll play Assassin's Creed, Warzone, some other stuff in the evening. I think that would be a lot of fun. (laughs) Anyways, thank you so much, everyone who joined me this morning. It was a lot of fun. Lake Erie can get rough. Yeah, Lake Erie is crazy. Lake Erie has hidden rocks. Um, I remember taking a boat from a beach over into the harbor near Port Colborne, and Lake Erie gets shallow randomly, really randomly in some parts. Um, so a lot of shipwrecks have happened on Lake Erie because of, like, how, like, there's just random shallow areas all throughout the lake for whatever reason. It's very deep in, in most areas, but then in, in, like, the most randomest of areas, it gets very shallow. Yeah, the waves can get crazy. And that's, yeah, a lot of shipwrecks happen on, on Lake Erie. Used to get sick swimming in the lake after a storm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Constant ear infections from Lake Erie. Same. <laughs> but it's fun. Use the, the lake's um the lake's waves for like wakeboarding. Take a little wakeboard out. There's an undertow, nobody cared. Get get pushed back in on your wakeboard bodyboard, wakeboard, I don't know what other people call them, we call them wakeboards, but 
<laughs> you guys are all so close. That's fun. That's fun. <laughs> but yeah, constant ear infections from Lake Erie. Not a lake that, that you necessarily want to swim in every day. <laughs> Body surfing on eight foot thrashing waves near a death experience than riding my bike. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Same. Same. That's a lot of fun. We would specifically vote, um, like we would we would watch the weather and if it was like kind of a cloudy, windy day, we'd be like bodyboarding time. <laughs> time to go to Wildwood Beach. <laughs> Uh, we wouldn't ride our bikes there if we drive there because we were far but go go and body surf on Lake Erie right right when it's windy <laughs> who cares about undertow <laughs> so many people have died in Lake Erie though <laughs> thanks for joining in Mary oh the dead fish oh yeah there's so much dead fish on the shoreline Ugh. So many seagulls picking at the dead fish. <laughs> yeah, lots of dead fish on the shoreline. Lots of seaweed, lots of dank ass smell. Like whenever somebody mentions Lake Erie, I can immediately smell Lake Erie. It has a very, very distinct smell to the lake. <laughs> and the sand. The sand was not nice. It was sand, but it was like gritty sand. Like coarse sand. Hmm. But I can smell it. Soon, It's like, it's a burned in memory. That smell. <laughs> Dirty dank sand. <laughs> yep. <Yeah>, absolutely. <laughs> Anyways. I could, I could reminisce about this all day, that's for sure. In the meantime, anyways, I do have to get going here. <laughs> I keep pausing myself. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. It was... I, I like these series. I like doing these a, lot, a little bit more than, uh, than uh, um, you know, just playing video games. It's, it's, it's more fun. It gets my brain working in the morning. So I think I'm going to do them more often in the morning, leave video games for the evening. And yeah... Anyways, thank you again, everyone, so much for joining. I hope to see you all on the next stream. I'll probably stream this evening, uh, Assassin's Creed. Yeah, I'm going to listen to the rest of that Ma Iron Maiden song for sure. I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get copy striked on, uh, on Twitch here, so I'm just going to, I'll listen to it myself, but that's so cool. <laughs> Anyways, thank you again, everyone, so much, and I hope to see you on the next uh, stream. I can be followed on both uh, Instagram and Twitter if you want to follow me on there just to keep up to date with other stuff. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much again, everyone, and I hope to see you all in the next stream. I need to, I need to get rid of that next stream because that's old. Look at how old that is. <laughs> All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>